from around the globe, it's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Hi, and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon Europe 2020's virtual event. I'm Stu Miniman and happy to welcome back to the program two of our CUBE alumni. We're going to be talking about storage in this Kubernetes and container world. First of all, we have Sam Warner. He is the Vice President of Storage Offering Management at IBM. And joining him is Brent Compton, Senior Director of Storage and Data Architecture at Red Hat. Sam and Brent, thank you for joining us. And uh, we get to really dig in as to the kind of the combined IBM and Red Hat activity in this space. Of course, both companies very active uh, in the space ahead of the acquisition. And so excited to hear about uh, what, what's going, going forward. Uh, Sam, may, maybe if we could start with you. Uh, as the tee up, uh, you know, both Red Hat and IBM have had their conferences this year. We've heard quite a bit about how you know, Red Hat, the, the, the solutions they've offered, the open source activity uh, is, is really a foundational layer for much of what IBM's doing. Uh, when it comes to storage, you know, what, what does that mean today? First of all, uh, I'm really excited uh, to be virtually at uh, KubeCon uh, this year. And I'm also really excited to be with uh, my colleague Brent from Red Hat. This is, I think, the first time that IBM Storage and Red Hat Storage have been able to get together and really articulate uh, what we're doing uh, to help our customers in the context of uh, Kubernetes and and also with OpenShift and the things we're doing there. So uh, I think you'll find, uh, you know, as we talk today, that there's a lot of work we're doing to bring together the core capabilities of IBM Storage that have been helping enterprises with their core applications for years alongside uh, the incredible open source capabilities being developed, uh, uh, you know, by Red Hat and, and how we can bring those together to help customers uh, continue moving forward with their initiatives around Kubernetes and uh, rebuilding their applications to be uh, uh, developed once deploy anywhere, uh, which runs into quite a few challenges for storage. So uh, Brent and I are excited to talk about all the great things we're doing, excited about uh, getting to share it with uh, everybody else at KubeCon. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, of course, containers when they first came out were for stateless uh, environments, and we knew. Uh, that you know, we we've seen this before. You know, those those of us that lived through uh, the wave of virtualization, you kind of have a first generation solution. You know, what applications, what environments can be used. But if you know, as we've seen the the, the huge explosion of containers and Kubernetes, uh, there's going to be a maturation of the stack. Storage is a critical com component of that. So maybe, yeah, Brent, if if you could bring us up to speed. You know, you're you're steeped and have. Uh, you know, long history in this space. Uh, you know, the challenges that you were hearing from customers, um, and and where 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 are we today in in 2020 for this set? Thanks, Stu. Stu, the most basic apps out there, I think, are just traditional um, databases, uh, apps that have databases like a Postgres, um, a, a long-standing apps out there that have app databases like DB2. So traditional apps that are moving towards a more agile environment. That's where we've seen, in fact, our collaboration with IBM and particularly the DB2 team. And that's where we've seen as they've gone to a microservices container-based architecture, we've seen a pull from the marketplace say, you know, in addition to inventing new cloud native apps, we want our tried, true, and tested apps. I mean, such as DB2 such as MQ. We want those to have the benefits of a Red Hat OpenShift Agile environment. And that's where the collaboration between our group and Sam's group comes in together, is providing the storage and data services for those stateful apps. Great, so, Sam, uh, you, you know, I, I, IBM, you've been working with the storage administrator for a long time. It, it, what, what challenges are they facing when we go to the new architectures? Is it still the same people? It might there be a, a, a different uh, part of the organization where you need to start uh, in, in delivering these solutions? That's a really, really good question. And it's interesting because I do spend a lot of time with storage administrators uh, and, and the people who are operating the IT infrastructure. And, and what you'll find is that the decision maker isn't the IT operations or storage operations people. 
these decisions about implementing Kubernetes and moving applications to these uh, new environments are actually being driven by the business lines, which is, I guess, not so different from any other major technology shift. And the storage administrators now are struggling to keep up. So the business lines would like to accelerate development. They want to move to a develop once deploy anywhere model. And so they start moving down the path of Kubernetes in order to do that. They start, you know, leveraging middleware uh, and components that are containerized and easy to deploy. And then they're turning to the IT infrastructure teams and asking them to be able to support it. And when you talk to the storage administrators, they're trying to figure out how to do some of the basic things that are absolutely core to what they do, which is protecting the data in the event of a disaster or some kind of a cyber attack, uh, being able to recover the data, being able to keep the data safe, ensuring governance and privacy of the data. These things are difficult in any environment, but now you're moving to a completely new world. And uh, the storage administrators have a, have a tough challenge ahead of them. And I think that's where IBM and Red Hat can really come together with all of our experience and our very broad portfolio with uh, incredibly enterprise hardened storage capabilities uh, to help them uh, move from their more traditional infrastructure to a uh, Kubernetes environment. All right, uh, Brent, maybe if you could bring us up to date uh, when we look back at like OpenStack, uh, Red Hat had a few projects uh, from an open source standpoint actually made some acquisitions uh, to help bolster uh, the open source storage world. Uh, in the container world, we saw some of those get ported over. Uh, there's some new projects. Uh, there's been a little bit of uh, argument as to the various different ways to do storage. And of course we know uh, storage has never been a single solution. Uh, there, there's lots of different ways to do things, but uh, you know, where are we uh, with uh, the options out there? Uh, what, what, what's, the, what's, what's the recommendation uh, from, from Red Hat and IBM as to how we should look at that? I want to bridge your question to Sam's earlier comments about the, the challenges facing the storage admin. So if we start with the word agility, I mean, what does agility mean for in a data world? We're conscious for agility from an application development standpoint, but if you use the term, of course, we've been used to the term DevOps, but if we use the term data ops, what does that mean? What does that mean to, in the past for decades, when a, a developer or someone deploying in production wanted to create new uh, storage or data resources, it typically, they typically filed a ticket and waited. So in the agile world of OpenShift and Kubernetes, it's everything is self-service and on-demand. Well, what, what kind of constraints and demands does that place on the storage and data infrastructure? So now I'll, I'll come back to your question, Stu. So yes, at the time that Red Hat was uh, um, uh, very heavily into OpenStack, Red Hat acquired Ceph, uh, well, acquired Ink Tank and, and uh, a majority of the Ceph developers who are most active in the community. And now, so, and that became the, the de facto software defined storage for uh, OpenStack. But uh, actually from the last time that we spoke at KubeCon, uh, the, the Rook project has become very popular there in the CNCF as a way effectively to make software defined storage systems like Ceph simple. So effectively the power of Ceph made simple by Rook inside of the OpenShift operator framework. People want that power uh, that Ceph brings, but they want the simplicity of self-service on demand. And that's kind of the, the fusion, the coming together uh, of traditional software defined storage with agility in a Kubernetes world. So Rook, Ceph, OpenShift container storage. Wonderful, and I wonder if we could take that a little bit further. Uh, a lot of the discussion these days, and I, I hear it uh, every time I talk to IBM and Red Hat, is how customers are using hybrid clouds. Um, so obviously that has to have an impact on storage. You know, moving data is not easy. Um, there's a little bit of nuance there. So, you know, how do we go from what you were just talking about into a hybrid environment? I, I guess I'll take that one to start. And uh, Brent, uh, please feel free to uh, chime in on it. So um, first of all, from an IBM perspective, 
you, you really have to start uh, at a little bit higher level and at the middleware layer. So IBM is bringing together all of our capabilities, everything from analytics and AI uh, to application development and, uh, uh, and, and all of our middleware uh, and, and packaging them up in something that we call cloud packs, which are pre-built catalogs of containerized uh, capabilities uh, that can be easily deployed uh, in any open shift environment, which allows customers to build applications that can be deployed uh, both on premises and then within public cloud. So in a hybrid multi-cloud environment. Of course, when you build that sort of environment, you need a storage and data layer, which allows you to move those applications around freely. And that's where the IBM storage suite for cloud packs comes in. We've actually taken uh, the core capabilities of the IBM storage software defined storage portfolio um, which give you everything you need for high performance block storage, scale out, um, uh, file storage, and object storage. And then we've combined that with the capabilities uh, uh, that we were just discussing um, from Red Hat, uh, which including OCS uh, and Ceph, which allow you, uh, a customer, to create a common uh, agile and automated storage environment, both on premises in the cloud, giving consistent deployment and the ability to orchestrate the data to where it's needed. Uh, I'll just add on to that. Uh, I mean, uh, as Sam noted, and as probably most of you are aware, hybrid cloud is at the heart of the uh, IBM acquisition of Red Hat. Uh, with Red Hat OpenShift, the stated intent of Red Hat OpenShift is to be to become the default operating environment for the hybrid cloud. So effectively, uh, bring your own cloud wherever you run. So that that is at the very heart uh, of the synergy between our companies, uh, made manifest by the very large portfolios of software, which have been which have been uh, um, moved to uh, many of which to run in containers and uh, embodied inside of IBM Cloud Packs. So IBM Cloud Packs backed by Red Hat OpenShift uh, on wh wherever you're running, on premises, in, in a public cloud, uh, and now with this storage suite for Cloud Packs that Sam referred to, also having a deterministic experience. That's one of the things as we work, for instance, deeply with the IBM DB2 team, one of the things that was critical for them is they couldn't have they couldn't have their customers when they run on AWS have a completely different experience than when they ran on premises, say, on VMware or on premises on bare metal. Critical to the DB2 team to, to give their customers deterministic behavior wherever they ran. Right, so Sam, I, I think any of our audience that have followed this space have heard Red Hat's story about OpenShift and how it, it lives across multiple cloud environments. Uh, I'm not sure that everybody is familiar with, with how much of IBM's storage solutions today are really just software driven. So, uh, and, and therefore, you know, if I think about IBM, it's like, okay, I can buy storage or yes, it can live in the IBM cloud. Um, but from what I'm hearing from Brent and you, and from what I know from previous discussion, uh, this is independent and can live in multiple clouds, leveraging this underlying technology um, and can leverage the capabilities from those public cloud offer. Is that right, Sam? Yeah, that's right. And uh, you know, we have the most comprehensive portfolio of software defined storage in the industry. Uh, maybe to some, it's a, it's a well-kept secret, uh, but those that use it know uh, the breadth of the portfolio. Uh, we have everything from the highest performing uh, scale-out file system to uh, uh, object store that can scale into the exabytes. Uh, we have our block storage as well, which runs uh, within the public clouds and can extend back uh, to your private cloud environment. When we talk to customers about deploying storage for hybrid multi-cloud in a container environment, we give them a lot of paths to get there. Uh, we give them the ability to leverage their existing SAN infrastructure uh, through uh, the CSI drivers, container storage interface. So our whole uh, you know, physical on-prem infrastructure supports CSI today. And then all the software that runs on our arrays also supports running 
uh, on top of the public clouds, giving customers then the ability to extend that existing SAN infrastructure uh, into a cloud environment. And now with Storage Suite for Cloud Packs, uh, as Brent described earlier, we give you the ability uh, to build a really agile infrastructure, leveraging the capabilities uh, from Red Hat that give you a fully extensible environment and uh, common way of managing and deploying both on-prem and in the cloud. So we give you a journey with our portfolio uh, to get from your existing infrastructure today, you don't have to throw it out, get started with that and build out an environment that goes both on-prem and in the cloud. Yeah, uh, and, and Brent, I, I'm glad that you started with database because it, it's not something that I think most people would think about, uh, you know, in, in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, do you do you have any customer examples you might be able to give? Maybe anonymized, of course. Um, just talking about how those mission critical applications uh, can fit into the, the the new modern architecture. The big banks. I mean, just full stop. The big banks. Uh, but what I'd add to that, so that's kind of frequently where they start because uh, applications based on structured data uh, are, remain at the heart of a lot of enterprises. But I would say workload category number two are uh, is all things machine learning, analytics, uh, AI. And we're seeing an explosion of adoption within the OpenShift and of course Cloud Pack, IBM Cloud Pack for Data is a key market participant in that machine learning and analytics space. So an explosion of the usage of, uh, of OpenShift for those types of workloads. And I'm just gonna touch just briefly on an example, going back to our kind of data, uh, data pipeline and how it, it started with databases, but it, it just, it, it explodes. For instance, uh, data pipeline automation where you have uh, data coming into your apps that are Kubernetes based, that are OpenShift based, well, maybe you'll end up inside of uh, uh, Watson Studio, inside of IBM uh, uh, Cloud Pack for Data. But along the way, there are a variety of transformations that need to occur. Let's say that you're at a big bank, you need to effectively, as it comes in, you need to be able to run a, a, a CRC to ensure, to attest that when, when you modify the data, for instance, in a real-time processing pipeline, that when you pass it on to the next stage, that you can guarantee, uh, well, that you can attest that there's been no tampering of the data. So that's an illustration where it began very with the basics uh, of basic applications running with structured data, uh, with databases, where we're seeing the state of the industry today is tremendous use uh, of these uh, uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift based architectures uh, for machine learning analytics uh, made more simple by data, pay, uh, data pipeline automation through things like OpenShift container storage, through things like OpenShift serverless, uh, where you have scalable functions and, and whatnot. So yeah, it began there, but boy, I tell you what, it's exploded since then. Yeah, it's great to hear not only traditional applications, but as you said, so, so much interest and need for those new analytics use cases. Uh, so, so absolutely, that, that's where it's going. Sam, one, one other piece of the storage story, of course, is, is not just that we have stateful uh, usage, but talk about data protection, if you could, uh, and how you know, things that I think of traditionally, you know, my backup, uh, re restore, and the like, uh, how does that fit into the, the whole discussion we've been having? Yeah, you know, when you talk to customers, it's one of the biggest challenges they have, honestly, in moving to containers, is how do I get the same level of data protection that I use today? Uh, the environments are, in many cases, more complex from a data and storage perspective. You want to uh, be able to take application consistent copies of your data that can be recovered quickly. Uh, and, and in some cases, even reused. Uh, you can reuse the copies for dev test, for application migration. Uh, there's, there's lots of, or, or for actually AI or analytics, there's lots of use cases for the data. But a lot of the tools and APIs are still still very new uh, in this space. IBM has made uh, prior, uh, doing data protection for containers a, a top priority for our Spectrum Protect suite. And we provide the capabilities to do application aware snapshots uh, of your storage environment uh, so that a Kubernetes developer can actually build in uh, the resiliency they need as they build applications. And a storage administrator can get a pane of glass uh, and visibility into 
all of the data and ensure that it's all being protected appropriately and provide things like SLAs. So I think it's about, you know, the fact that the early days of Kubernetes tended to be stateless. Now that people are moving uh, some of their more mission critical workloads, the data protection becomes just as critical as anything else you do in the environment. So the tools have to catch up. So that's a top priority of ours. And we provide a lot of those capabilities today. And you'll see, if you watch what we do with our Spectrum Protect Suite, we'll continue to provide the capabilities that our customers need to move uh, their mission critical applications to a Kubernetes environment. All right, and Brent, one other uh, question looking forward a little bit. Uh, we, we've been talking for the last couple of years about how uh, serverless can plug into this uh, entire uh, Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, the Knative project is one that I, IBM and Red Hat have been involved with. So for OpenShift and serverless, uh, we, I'm, I'm sure he's leveraging Knative. What, what is the update today? The update is effectively adoption inside of uh, it, a lot of cases like the big banks, but also uh, other uh, top, uh, the largest companies in other industries as well. So if you take the words event-driven architecture, uh, many of them are coming to us with that's kind of top of mind to them, is uh, the need to say, you know, I need to ensure that when data first hits my environment, I can't wait. I can't wait for a scheduled batch job to come along and process that data and maybe run an inference. I mean, the classic case is you're ingesting a chest X-ray and you need to immediately run that against an inference model to determine if the patient has pneumonia or COVID-19 and then kick off another serverless function to anonymize the data to send, uh, send back in to retrain your model. So uh, the need, uh, and so you mentioned serverless, and of course people would say, well, I could, I could handle that just by really smart batch jobs. But kind of one of the other parts of serverless that sometimes people forget, but smart companies are aware of, is that serverless is inherently scalable. So zero to N scalability. So as data is coming in, hitting your Kafka bus, hitting your object store, hitting your database. I don't know if you picked up the, the community project Debezium, where something hits your relational database and that can automatically trigger uh, an event onto the Kafka bus so that your entire arch, uh, architecture becomes event driven. All right, well, Sam, let, let me give you the fun, let me let you have the final word, excuse me, on uh, the IBM uh, in this space and what you want them to have as takeaways from KubeCon 2020 Europe. I'm actually going to talk to, I think, the storage administrators, if that's okay, because if you're not involved right now in the Kubernetes projects that are happening uh, within your enterprise, uh, they are happening and there will be new challenges. You've got a lot of investments you've made in your existing storage infrastructure. Uh, we at IBM and Red Hat can help you take advantage of the value of your existing infrastructure. Uh, the capabilities, the resiliency, the security you've built into it for the years, and we can help you move forward into a hybrid multi-cloud environment uh, built on containers. Uh, we've got the experience and the capabilities between Red Hat and IBM uh, to help you be successful uh, because it's still a lot of uh, challenges there, uh, but, but our experience can help you uh, implement that with the greatest success. I appreciate it. All right, Sam and Brent, thank you so much for joining. It's been excellent to be able to watch the, the maturation in this space over the last couple of years. Thank you. All thank right, you. we'll be back with lots more coverage from KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, Europe 2020, the virtual event. I'm Stu Miniman, and thank you for watching theCUBE.